So we are beginning a new series uh, this today, and we are extending it throughout the summer, and it is, uh, we're going to be exploring Mark, so the gospel according to Mark, and we have a, a short video that kind of uh, is a summary of that, so check this out. Jesus. And the earliest reliable tradition tells us that it was written by a guy named John Mark. Now Mark didn't just grab a bunch of random stories about Jesus and throw them together. He's designed this book to address some really specific questions about whether or not Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. So let's stop right there because that's a term a lot of people like me aren't very familiar with. Yeah, so the Messiah was a royal figure, sometimes called the Son of God, that Israel was expecting to come and set up a kingdom here on earth. And around the time of Jesus, Israel was occupied by Rome, and so many Jews were hoping that the Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans and rule as king. But Jesus didn't overthrow the Romans. In fact, he was killed by them. And that brings us to the very issues Mark is trying to get at in this book. So in the first half, he focuses on who Jesus is. Is he really the Messiah? And then in the second half, he's addressing how Jesus became the Messianic King. And then right here in the middle of the book is this pivotal story that brings the two halves together, and Jesus answers both of these questions. Okay, so let's talk about the first half of the book, who Jesus is. So Mark makes his beliefs about Jesus very clear from the first line of the book. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. One of the next stories is Jesus getting baptized and God's voice announces from heaven, this is my son. So it couldn't be more clear, it's presenting Jesus as the Messiah. Yes, but as you're reading through this first half of Mark, you'll notice something really interesting start to happen. Jesus is going about healing all these different people, and he's constantly telling them to keep quiet about who he is. This happens so many times in Mark's account. It's very strange. Yeah, why keep it a secret? So remember, lots of Jews had lots of different expectations about what the Messiah would be and do. And so Jesus doesn't want people to misunderstand what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah. And so with all that in mind, we come now to the pivotal story at the center of the book where Jesus takes his disciples away and he asks them, who do you all say that I am? And Peter says what everyone's been saying, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. But then something new happens because Jesus starts explaining to them how he's going to become the Messianic King, and it is not what they expected. He says he's going to suffer and die and rule by becoming a servant, or in his words, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to become a servant and to give his life as a ransom for many. Peter is startled by this and he rebukes Jesus because there's no way he's going to let Jesus die. And Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan, which is really intense. It really is. But it highlights how important it is for Jesus that his disciples come to understand who he really is. And so here now in this pivotal section, Jesus tries three different times to have this conversation with them. And every time they respond in confusion and even fear. Okay, so this launches us into the second half of the book, where Mark addresses the question of how Jesus becomes the Messianic King. It's the last week of Jesus' life. He goes to Jerusalem, gets in conflict with the religious leaders, and gets arrested. And he's put on trial as someone who's claiming to be the king of the Jews. He's even given a crown and a purple robe like a king would get, but it is all a cruel joke. Then he's mocked and beaten and hung up on a cross where he dies. And it's here in this crucial scene that we meet a new character. A Roman soldier. Who suddenly gets everything that's going on. He says, surely this is the son of God. Which is crazy. It's an enemy who's first putting it all together that Israel's messianic king is the crucified Jesus. That's the structure of the book of Mark. But the book doesn't end with Jesus dead on the cross. No. So on the third day, some women go to visit Jesus' tomb, only to find that it's empty. And then there's this angel standing there, instructing them to go and tell this good news that Jesus is alive from the dead. But instead, they run away and they don't tell anyone because they're afraid. And that's how the book ends. Which is a really abrupt ending. Yeah, it's so abrupt that later scribes did add an ending that brings more closure to the story. And you'll find that story in your Bible with a little footnote that says it was added much later. But Mark's a brilliant storyteller, and he's intentionally ended this book abruptly. 
So all through the book, the disciples have been confused about Jesus' plan to give up his life, the story in the middle, and now right here at the end. It's like Mark is acknowledging just how startling this claim really is. And he wants you, the reader, to wrestle with it for yourself. Is this crucified Jesus really the Messiah that they've been waiting for? Well, good morning. Glad to see you that are here and those that are online. We trust that uh, you're having a good morning and a good start to your uh, holiday weekend. Glad to uh, be present with you all. Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet, uh, my name is Brian Roberts and I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, and so for those of you who are here in person, uh, if you have a little bit of time after the service, I'll be up here in the front. We can chat a little bit. I'd love to kind of get to know you a little bit and just to see a little bit of your story. If you're, on, if you're online and you're relatively new, uh, I'd love for you to sign in and, and let us know. That way we can reach out to you and let you know the various things that are going on and we can uh, connect with you as well. Uh, as has already mentioned, Jason and Jake, and then this little video that we're studying uh, the gospel of Mark, the gospel according to Mark through the summer and into the, into the fall here. And when we study the, the stories here in the gospel of Mark, what we'll see is a picture of Jesus as the Messiah, this, this messianic person that has come to inaugurate his kingdom and the kind of people that we would become if we submit ourselves to the kingship of Jesus. If we would submit ourselves to his ways and we follow after him, that we get a picture of the kind of person that we would become in the kingdom of God as we follow after Jesus, our king. As we study the book of Mark together, uh, we're going to see how Jesus establishes his kingdom, his rule, his way of living in this world uh, through his servanthood and through his sacrifice. We're going to see how he does it all throughout the gospel. We'll see how he serves and how he's placing himself as a servant. And how those who are in the kingdom will learn to live that way as well. That we will learn to live self-sacrificial, servant kind of ways in our life. What we'll see as Jesus describes and as he models, and we'll talk a little bit about this this morning, but what we'll see is how the kingdom of God is not like the kingdoms of this world where it's kind of this power struggles and power over, but it's an upside down kind of kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom where the greatest will be the least among us, where we'll learn to serve well, where we'll learn how to, uh, to give of our loving kindness towards one another rather than trying to manipulate our power over each other. As we move through this series, as Jake was mentioning, we've got these uh, journals that we've put together. And if you're online, there's an online journal there as well. Uh, but if you're here in person, again, you're not going to offend me if you want to go grab one uh, even as we speak, as we go today. Because in part of these journals, there'll be some times for us to study, some things for us to read. But in, like on, chap on, verse, or, uh, verse, on page 9 this morning, uh, is a little sermon note section. And it's just a blank uh, piece of paper with a bunch of lines that you can be taking notes uh, of all the various things that we'll be talking about this morning. So I encourage you to kind of do that stuff this morning. But as we go through the whole series, I want to kind of lay a little bit of introduction to what we're doing. And what we're asking each other to do is to engage into three practices as we go together. Three practices that we can engage. The hope is that during this series, during the summer and into the fall series here, that as we dive into this book of, of Mark, that we wouldn't do so just to show up on a Sunday morning to hear some teaching and write down some notes, but we would engage into some things and move it beyond Sunday morning that we'd actually dive into it together, to engage into some practices to see how we can apprentice ourselves after the ways of Jesus, that we would find our ways, learning to live our life the way Jesus would live our life if he were us. So there's three practices that we're going to engage in, that we're going to invite us into. And the first practice is to study together. Study together. Significant growth in our spiritual life happens when we just dive into Scripture and we immerse ourselves into Scripture more than just once a week, more than just once a month, more than just occasionally, but to immerse ourselves on a regular basis, two, three, four times a week, where we would be studying the Scriptures together. Again, this is why we provide these journals for you. That you would read the chapter ahead of time, that you read the chapter and then you have some questions to kind of guide you along, make some notes, make some things that you've thought about. 
and then come on a Sunday morning to listen to a sermon that's, ga- that's based on that chapter, to write some more notes and to kind of see what God is stirring up in you, that we would stir and we would study the Scriptures together, to make these notes, to write down, to journal in them, to bring your Bible with you on, su- on Sunday mornings, to open it up together. If you have it on your phone, that's fine, but to bring a Bible with you. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have some in the back tables available for you. Just, just come in, grab them, and just open them up and continue to, to study together. It's a, it's a good practice to get into, to study the Scriptures together, to actively listen, to actively take notes along the way, to read and to, to circle, to underline, to those kind of things. So first practice that we're going to engage in over these next couple months, study together, study together. Second practice that we're going to engage in is we're going to seek to engage the practice of memorization. That we're going to memorize, in particular, memorize Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45 together. As you heard in the little video right there in the middle of the gospel is a central piece of this kind of summary statement that Mark writes about Jesus. And and it's recorded in Mark chapter 10 verse 42 through 45 that kind of summarizes all that Mark is talking about when it relates to Jesus, this king, and his kingdom. And the kind of kingdom that Jesus is coming to inaugurate. And the kind of king that he is going to be. And the kind of people that we are to be as citizens of the kingdom. So Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 45, something we're going to try to memorize. We're just going to try and do it. However that means, use your journal to write it down, to write it down and recite it a couple times during the week. It says this, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and give his life as a ransom for many. Now that may seem daunting to you, that you're going to memorize all of those verses in a few months here. But I just want to challenge you that just about every one of you have lyrics to songs memorized, right? Right? It's possible. You can do I believe in you. You can do this. And it's just simply going to be read over it. Read over it in whatever translation you want to do. Read over it. Write it down a few times. Try to do it by memory. You'll be able to get it. Eventually you'll have it in memorized or memorized in your memory. And there's just something very good about hiding God's word in our heart to sear it into our minds that you can bring it back. And you can recite it and keep that mind, that, that idea in your mind as we go. As you study and continue to seek to memorize this passage. Because it is a great summary of the mission of Jesus. In verse, chapter 10, verse 45, Before this evening the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. To keep that summary of Jesus and his ministry in the front of our mind, that we would continue to have that. So we would do this. We would study together to understand as citizens of the kingdom of God, what is, it God, what is God calling us to do? And as a means of practice, we memorize that passage, that central summary passage of Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Just simply write, read it and write it a couple times a week to try to recite it and get that seared into our mind. But that leads me to the third practice that we're going to do over this series, and that is to intentionally serve. To intentionally serve over these next few weeks together. That not only do we study, not only do we memorize, but we put into practice what we are reading and studying and memorizing. For a life with Jesus, this apprenticeship with Jesus is learning to live the way Jesus would live if he were us. Which means it's much more than just intellectual acknowledgement of who Jesus is. It's not just about being able to prove that you can memorize things and win at Bible trivia. But it's learning how to live the way Jesus would live if he were living your life. Which means we're going to study, we're going to memorize, and intentionally place yourself in the role of servant. In your family, at the store, with your coworkers, wherever you find yourself, 
to intentionally place yourself each week, at least once a week, to intentionally find your place. How can I serve someone this week? How can I serve? For Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So how can we follow in the ways of our king, the servant king, by learning how to serve, given our life as a way? And as we'll see in the first part of Mark, how he serves and he tells people not to tell anybody. How is it that we can intentionally serve and not tell anybody? And all the while, while we're studying and we're memorizing and we're serving and we're doing these over these next few weeks, pay attention to your own heart. Pay attention to your need or your desire to get accolades and get recognition for all the serving and for how well you can memorize more than other people can memorize. Pay attention to that part of you that is tempted to just get all the attention on yourself and to seek to find new ways to be more like Christ. So that's where we're going during this series the Gospel of Mark. Let's study together. Let's memorize. Let's intentionally serve together. Fair enough? That's where we're trying to go. Hey, let me pray. Let's dive into chapter 1. But let me pray for us this morning. We'll see what God will teach us. Jesus, we're humbled and amazed that you would come to those of us who are far from you. And you would seek to invite us to life, eternal life right now. So, Father, I pray that as we open the Scriptures This morning as we seek to study together and to learn together and to walk with you, that you would change us from the inside out, that our hearts and our minds, our bodies would be more like you as a result. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, there's lots of stuff we can talk about in Mark chapter 1. We're going to do one chapter each time we get together. And this is part of the reason why you to study and to write on your own, because I'm not going to be able to, to cover all of chapter 1 in just these few moments that we have. So I'm just going to zero in on one passage, one part of chapter 1. So if you have a Bible or a phone or some app that you can open up, chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 18 is where we're going to settle into this morning, and to give you a second to open up or turn on your phones or get to there. But Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 18 is where we are. And then, uh, and if you don't have those, you can follow along on the screens and we'll go from there. So starting in verse 9, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into their lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now the kingdom of God, as Jesus announces here in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the kingdom of God is his primary message. It's what he spoke most about. He described it. He, he gave parables about it. He demonstrated it. But Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the, very, the, the primary message of Jesus was the kingdom of God. And he invited people to begin living within that kingdom right now. And following Jesus as king in his kingdom would involve intentionally laying aside our will to say not what I want, but what you want to have happen. So it's an intentionally laying aside my will to follow after Jesus in his kingdom, to follow after the purposes of God. And when we do that, when we intentionally put aside our will and live under the kingdom of God, we will find that it brings abundant, eternal, good life, even right now. So this kingdom of God, this understanding of the kingdom, it was his primary message. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at how he describes it right at the very beginning and how we might understand it for ourselves today. 
And I want to make three observations about the kingdom of God that Jesus sees and he demonstrates here in the passage. And then as I make these observations, I'm just going to ask a few questions for us to consider this morning as we study together. Some observations of the kingdom and questions for us to consider as we go along. So the first observation I want us to notice is the availability of the kingdom. That the kingdom of God is available. And again, if you're a note taker, if you have a Bible that you don't mind writing in, verse 15 is one that you want to circle or underline. Verse 15 is one you want to come back to again and again. Because he says that the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Other translations of the scriptures would say that the kingdom of God is at hand or that the kingdom of God is near you or is close is right now. The kingdom of God is here. The time has come for the kingdom. In other words, Jesus is saying, it's right now. Jesus' primary message about the kingdom is that it is available. That life with God is available right now. Now, generally, there are two kind of mistakes that people make when you think about the kingdom of God or about the spiritual life or about life with God. I'm sure that there are more, but generally speaking, I just know of, a, or I want to point out at least two general mistakes that people think about when they think about the kingdom or life with God. And the first mistake that people think about when you think about the kingdom is you overly spiritualize it and you think that the kingdom of God is about something that happens when you die about where you will spend eternity. Will you go to heaven when you die or not? And they think that the predominant picture of the kingdom is about what happens after you die. But that's to miss the crucial point that Jesus has pointed out in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, where he says that the time has come, the kingdom is available, the kingdom is here, available. See, Jesus hasn't just come to give us eternity, where there's celestial music and angels around all the time. He hasn't just come to give us that. He's come, he says, that the time has come now, that life with God is available now. To have the kind of life that's eternal and abundant and good starting now, the kind that we were made for, Jesus says that time has come. It's available right now. And it'll be substantially better than any kind of life you can ever imagine. And it will last for eternity but it, the time has come now. Time has come now. And it will involve you intentionally laying aside your will or what you want to have happen in your life for you to take up the way of Jesus, to, to purpose yourself as the way of, of Christ. It will take that, but it is available now. It's not simply what happens when you die. See, the first mistake people make when they think about the kingdom or life with God is it's predominantly centered around what happens when you die and not about what happens when you live when you live a second mistake that people think about when they think about life with God or in this interactive life with God this kingdom life is that it's for the super spiritual people that, that have everything their life all in order have, have cleaned themselves up and have done everything the way that God wants them to no matter no matter what their history is but Jesus makes it very clear Right here in the very beginning of his public ministry, that the kingdom of God is available to all who would repent and believe. No matter your story, no matter your history, no matter your mess ups, no matter all the stuff that you bring with you, he says the kingdom of God is available. All that is required is that you repent, that you would to turn away from your ways and to pick up his way. His way. You don't have to clean yourself up, in other words. The life with God is available to you, and that's all God's grace. Grace is God's activity in your life to do for you what you cannot do on your own. And making life available to you in his kingdom, you cannot do on your own. And therefore, it's grace. It's his activity to make available life, eternal life, beginning right now. By grace, this life with him is available now, it will require us to lay down our life, to lay down our ways, to lay down our wills. It will require that, to take up the ways of Christ, but the availability is by God's grace. By God's grace. So the first observation as we look into Mark chapter 1, as we understand the kingdom of God, the first observation is that it is available now. It's available now. 
So allow me to ask you a question. Has your primary understanding of the spiritual life or life with God, has it been preoccupied with what happens when you die? That you have neglected what happens when you live? Has your understanding of the kingdom, has your understanding of life with God been preoccupied with what happens for the rest of eternity? Or has the way in which you orient and structure and value your life now oriented around the distinctive way of the kingdom now? Have you understood that the time has come that the kingdom is available now? Or are you preoccupied with what happens when you die? Can I just remind you that Jesus says the time has come. The kingdom is available now. Let's begin to live this way. Lay down your life now and pick up the ways of Christ today. Pick up the ways of Christ today. Second observation that I want to make in this opening portion of Mark, and that is that we are in a kingdom that's in a war whose king has already won. The kingdom of God is a kingdom in a war whose king has already won. Notice what happens right after his baptism. Right after his baptism in, uh, in verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. Jesus is brought into the wilderness, and he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. And in verse, 15, sorry, verse 14, we see that John the baptizer is put into prison. Jesus is tempted by Satan. John is put into prison. And these first few verses, right after Jesus makes a declaration in his baptism, declares that he is willing to put his earthly will to death and to pick up the ways of God the Father, that he says, I don't want my will, but only what the Father says. He makes that a public declaration, and immediately he's sent out to the wilderness to be tempted by the Satan. And John is imprisoned. And so what we see in these first few verses of the public ministry of Jesus, it reminds us that we are in a spiritual battle fighting over evil and temptation, that there's a battle happening in the spiritual realm over our lives. We ought not to fool ourselves to think that just because you decide to follow Jesus with your life, that somehow you will miss all the challenges and the temptations and the evil around you. That somehow because you, you turn your life over to Jesus, that you put your will down to pick up his will, that somehow your life is going to be all rosy. The truth is, immediately, as soon as you turn your life over to Jesus, there will come temptation and battle, and you will be tempted to throw in the towel. You'll be tempted to think that this is not it. You'll be tempted to settle for mediocre Christianity. Maybe a little bit of Jesus, maybe to hopefully get you to heaven, but nothing else. Because it will be a challenge immediately after Jesus makes public his declaration to put aside his earthly will and take up the will of the Father. Immediately after John has been proclaiming and baptizing people, they're sent, he's sent into prison. Jesus is sent into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan. And I just want to be honest. When you turn your life over to the leadership of Jesus, there will come temptation and challenges and evil and things will come across your plate. There will be times when you will look around and you'll want to throw your hands up and shrug your shoulders and say, I've, I've tried my best, but that's all I can do. There will be times when you want to just throw in the towel and say, I can't do it anymore. Can't do it anymore. I thought this was supposed to be really good. I thought this was supposed to be this abundant life. I thought it was supposed to be amazing. I thought this was supposed to be this eternal, great, abundant life that, that Jesus has come to promise me. And it's challenging. And there will be people that will say challenging things and people who will attack your character and your integrity and your heart. And they'll come along. And sometimes they'll come immediately. And sometimes it will be fierce as it comes. But would you take heart? That while we're in a kingdom that's in a battle, our king has won. Jesus goes into the desert, into the wilderness, and he's tempted for 40 days. And yet the book of Hebrews tells us he's been tempted in every way known to man, yet was without sin. That he conquers. That, and in his death and resurrection, he wins the victory 
over sin and death and all that breaks us. And so while, yeah, there's a battle going on, and while, yeah, when you turn your life over to the leadership of Jesus, it won't mean that your life is, is rosy for the rest of your life. It will be a challenge. And there will be challenges that come to you. Yeah, that's true. But would you take heart to know that Christ has overcome? Jesus says it himself. He says, in this world you will face trials of many kinds, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. We're in a battle, but our king has already won. Our king has already won. And that ought to give us confidence. Don't accept defeat. When the challenges come your way and the temptations come your way, don't accept defeat to to assume that this is all that there is. For our king has won the victory. And we submit ourselves to him. So stay the course. Stay the course. So let me ask you a question. How have you been tempted How has it come to your life where you just go, maybe this is just all there is. Maybe this is all there is. Could I just encourage you with the truth that Jesus, while he was tempted in every way, is without sin. Therefore, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and intercede on our behalf. And he has not left you alone in the battle, but he has won victorious and he is walking with you. So stay the course. Stay the course. Third observation I want to bring during this little part of Mark chapter 1. The kingdom of God is a kingdom with a calling. The kingdom of God is a kingdom with a calling. Jesus calls his, uh, announces the kingdom is, is available. He says that the time has come. The kingdom is available. Then he subverts the powers of the world and he stays true into his obedience and righteousness and he doesn't give in to the temptation. He wins the victory. And notice what he does immediately after that, immediately coming out of the wilderness. In verse 17, he finds some disciples. He says, come, follow me, and I will send you to fish for people. In verse 17, he says, come and follow me and I will send you. Jesus calls Simon and Andrew and others. He calls them to join him. He says, come and follow me. Live this life in the kingdom of God now so that you can be sent and to bring that news and to bring that kingdom to the people around you. In other words, Jesus is not just simply offering eternal life for us to wait patiently on the sideline, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for one day when he's going to zap us into heaven. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom with a calling that we are invited to join, to participate with Jesus on his fine adventure of the kingdom of God at hand right now, where we are bringing about his goodness and his righteousness to the world around us. It's a kingdom with a calling. Every follower of Jesus follows the same kind of calling. He says, follow me and I will give you a purpose. Follow me and I will bring you an eternal kingdom purpose to bring this light and this good news to those around you to make God known Jesus announces the availability of the kingdom he wins the battle against temptation and against evil and he invites us to the adventure of working and partnering with Jesus to see this kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven it's a kingdom with a calling it's a calling that every one of us has on our life. And how do you do that? How do we partner with Jesus? How do we, how do we co- co-work with Jesus to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth? As it, how does that happen? Well, it happens by us intentionally laying aside our will and our way and taking up the way of Jesus to apprentice ourselves after the way of Jesus to do it the way he would do it. So let me ask you another question to consider this morning. What would it mean for you to see yourself as a sent person, sent by Jesus to the people around you to demonstrate his kingdom, to follow as an apprentice to Jesus, and to see yourself as sent into the world with a purpose, with a calling to draw people to the kingdom? What would that look like for you? 
You know that the greatest sermon ever to be given will never happen on a Sunday morning. It'll happen on a Monday through Friday and how you live. The greatest sermon is not what happens up here on this platform for 35, 45, 25, 15 minutes, however long it takes. The greatest sermon will be given Monday through Friday by how you live and by how I live. Follow me, Jesus says, and I will give you a purpose. I will send you with a kingdom purpose. Apprentice yourself after me. Learn my ways. Put aside your will. Take up my purposes, and I will send you with an eternal purpose in this world. And as we follow Christ, and as we take up the way of servanthood and self-sacrifice, we cooperate with him and to invite others into the kingdom, and we will see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what Jesus is announcing. This is what he's calling us to. He's calling us to a kingdom way of living. And it won't always be easy, but as we learn to trust in our perfect king, the one who has won the victory, then we will realize that while it's not always easy, it's always good. It's always eternal. It's always best. Now it would be the life that we've called, but it would take us learning to say no to ourselves and say yes to the way of Jesus. So as we study into this Gospel of Mark, as we look at the person of Jesus, let's study together well. Let's read through the Scriptures together. Let's write down notes and let's make some marks and let's understand together. Let's memorize Mark 10, 42 to 45 together. Let's sear that into our memory, into our minds, and, and hide it into our hearts. And let's embark on this grand adventure, this grand experiment of following the servant king by taking up the way of serving ourselves. To find ways to intentionally serve. For we are a people called to a kingdom for a purpose. For a purpose. And as we do that, may we find the eternal kind of life that Christ has led us to. Let's just see what God does in our midst as we apprentice ourselves after him as we study the word together. Hey, let me pray for us. Jesus, we are humbled by you today. That through your sacrifice, your servanthood, you lead us to an eternal way. Father, I pray that you would uh, re remove any thought that the kingdom is exclusively for eternal life or, or for something in the future. But you would give us a vision, fuel a, a vision in our life to live abundantly right now in your kingdom where you are the king and you lead us to this upside down kind of way where we serve and we give our lives away for others, loving them in your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing about this kingdom. kingdom come to the oppressed and to the poor set the captives free you came to open up blind eyes you gave up everything to offer life in the kingdom you're the king who died making all things new Mission is to follow after you. God of heaven, take our brokenness and use it for your good in the kingdom of new Your greatness, 
that you open up our hearts kingdom came to us even we who are the rich freed us from our sin after you opened up our eyes you gave up everything give us life in your kingdom you're the king who died who's making all things new our role and mission is to follow after you god of heaven take our brokenness and use it for your good in the kingdom of new life. The least are greater, the poor are richer, the child, the wisest of all. The valley's taller, the mountains are lower, and the great upside down, the kingdom of God. In your kingdom. is to follow after you. God of heaven, take our brokenness and use it for your good in the kingdom of new So before I pray and, and dismiss us out, uh, just a quick little reminder for you, as Pastor Jake had mentioned earlier in the service, if you were here last week for the Next 20 service celebration, uh, you heard a lot about the renovation and the project that we're hoping to be able to embark on. Uh, this Tuesday, we have another family meeting, just an informational time. If you want more information about that project and what that's going to look like and all the various details of that, I invite you to come back. We'll be here in in, uh, in the worship center. Uh, we'll be streaming that as well, so you can uh, let us know, and we'll be able to send you the link of where you can see that online. Ask your questions online as well if you're unable to make it here in person. Uh, but I also want to invite you, if you're here, out in the lobby, there's these little gift bags that we have for everybody that uh, has the, the mugs and some papers or some notes and, and pens and stickers and stuff like that, some fun little things. If you didn't get one last week, we'd love, to have, we'd love you to have one, take one with you. Uh, if you got one last week but you want another mug, we'd love to have you that too. So uh, feel free to grab a little gift bag as you leave this morning. Uh, there's also packets that say Next 20 on them that's got stories of impact and, and a little more details about this project that we're hoping to embark on. So you can get all the information, look at the drawings and those kinds of things. So there's lots to pick up today. Pick up your journals if you haven't picked those up. Pick up your gift bags and this little packet for the next 20. And again, remind you, this Tuesday is that family meeting at 7 o'clock. It'll be about an hour and 15 minutes uh, just to kind of answer any questions and kind of go after anything there. I uh, invite you all to come and be a part of that as well. Well, if you would stand with me today, uh, what we're going to do uh, during this series is, again, try to memorize this passage. So we're just going to read it today. Uh, and so no pressure. You don't have to have it memorized already, obviously. Um, but we're just going to try and read it over on a regular basis. And hopefully, as a part of that process, it'll kind of sear into our minds. So let's read this together, and then I'll pray and dismiss us out. So let's say, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, who wants to be... Sorry, that was me. Whoever wants to become greater among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me pray for us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, almighty, everlasting, triune God, I pray that as we go today, we go in the knowledge and the power that you are our victorious King, in whose kingdom we have been invited to live right now. So may we lay aside our will and our way and pick up your way. That as we intentionally serve and to, to see ourselves as sent, that you would meet us and shape our hearts and apprentice us to you, that we would do our life the way you would do it if you were us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming this morning.